everyone. Again, Monday morning, 6.30. We are here. Good morning, Dr. Joyita. Good morning, ma'am. So what I will do, I will request Dr. Joyita to speak uh, about few words for both the speaker, speaker as well as moderator. Because uh, it's, they are from TMS team and Dr. Joyita must be knowing better than me from about them. So I request Dr. Joyita to uh, introduce a speaker and moderator. And then please listen carefully all the lecture and whatever your queries will be, you put in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Josna, you can take the questions one by one or we, I will also keep an eye on the questions. Okay. Okay then. Go ahead, Dr. Jeta, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sushma, ma'am. Uh, good morning, everyone who is online. It's a pleasure to be always part of these IPC online uh, series of lectures. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Shreya Nair, uh, who is now a third year resident in uh, MD Palliative Medicine in Tata Memorial Hospital in our department. Uh, as you can see that her uh, interest is in uh, cancer pain management and that is what her uh, thesis topic is. She is also interested in renal supported care and uh, psycho-oncology. And all that that you can see, uh, what I have to tell you is that she is uh, very sincere, uh, lots of empathy for patients and does in her clinical work everything that's what she's supposed to do, of course, uh, because we have very long hours, people are quite overloaded, but despite that, with always a smile and never a frown, she would be taking care of in the OPD or in patients or emergency department and managing the patients and asking her seniors. And uh, just a bit of informal uh, info is that uh, she occasionally binges on Netflix shows, which actually I only suggest to her. So that is possibly my problem. Um, so uh, Dr. Shreya would be presenting on this opioids too. And to uh, moderate her session uh, would be Dr. Jotsna Kuryakose. You know that she's, uh, she's uh, completed her MD palliative medicine from Tata Memorial Hospital. Uh, she obtained her degree in 2021. And we are privileged to have her as a senior resident in our department. Her areas of interest are uh, clinical research, uh, palliative care and hematolymphoid cancers and musculoskeletal oncology. She is very interested in uh, patient reported outcome measures and serious illness communication. Um, I'm sure all of you know Jotsna already from the IAPC. So uh, she is another one who is extremely hardworking and dedicated. And uh, although she has been my student, she will always be my teacher. So over to you, Dr. Jotsna, for moderating the session. And Dr. Shreya, you may begin uh, your session now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, I'm Dr. Shreya. I am a resident in the Department of Palliative Medicine and Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. Uh, the topic allotted to me today is in continuation of OP. So covering a lecture or uh, before starting, just a quick disclaimer that we have to uh, patients uh, we've included uh, the dose conversations with adults uh, having uh, and how do we initiate uh, the patients uh, how does it go? So starting with the basic opioid, uh, that is codeine, uh, which is an opioid in the morphine, uh, which has a major metabolism in the liver. But, uh, two codeines is glucuronide by conjugation reaction. And about like, uh, Dr. Shreya? Hello? Hello? Yeah. 
Uh, Dr. Shah, yeah, your voice is breaking. Maybe you turn your video off so the bandwidth would be better. Uh, is this okay? This is much better. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, uh, okay. So we will start with uh, codeine, uh, which is an opium alkaloid, uh, which is one tenth as potent as morphine. Uh, which has a major metabolism uh, in the liver, uh, where it is metabolized to codeine cis glucuronide by conjugation reaction. Uh, so usually about less than 10% of codeine is biotransformed to morphine. Uh, demethylation reaction. Uh, so in patients who are poor metabolizers of CYP to D6, uh, they produce little to no morphine. Uh, so the energetic effect would be very less in these patients. And uh, alternately, it will be potentially toxic in patients who are ultra-rapid metabolizers of CYP. Transformation is CYP to D6. So uh, concurrent use of phloxapine, phloxapine, uh, this is to morphine and uh, Hence, codeine will lack significant energetic activity. It is an antidepressive and it also slows GI transit. So excreted in urine. Hence, it is more toxic in renal failure due to accumulation of morphine metabolic. Uh, it is a plane of exot combination or paracetamol. Uh, Use for children and adults. Uh, when given poor orally, the bioavailability of opioid is about 40 uh, a person. Uh, it can happen within 30 to 60 minutes of administration and reaches the peak plasma concentration in 1 to 2 hours. The half-life for the drug is 2.5 to 3.5 hours and it acts as well. Uh, coming on to tramadol, uh, tramadol is a synthetic centrally acting analgesic. It has both non-opioid as well as opioid properties. Uh, mainly has a presynaptic uh, reuptake of both serotonin as well as norepinephrine and acts as an agonist effect at the mu opioid risk. Uh, it also significantly improves neuropathic pain uh, with a number needed to treat of 3.8. It is as effective as codeine as a cough suppressant. Uh, it is less dissipating and causes less depression if uh, compared with equianalgesic doses of morphine. It reduces, uh, when compared with morphine, it also reduces the basal pressure in the sense of ODI and does not increase the pressure in the common bile duct. Its dependence liability is also considerably less than the drugs. However, higher doses uh, do cause vomiting, dizziness, and anorexia, and the maximum recommended dose is 400 milligrams per day. Uh, now, the analgesic effect of tramadol is reduced by ondansetron, possibly by blocking the action of serotonin at the presynaptic 5 st 3 receptors on the primary afferent nociceptive neurons in the spinal dorsal one. Uh, hence, co-administration of tramadol uh, with ondansetron uh, can be avoided as best possible. Uh, tramadol is also metabolized in the liver via the CYP2D6 uh, and uh, via the same, uh, it forms a metabolite which is O-desmethyl tramadol, uh, which, is the, which is responsible for the energetic effect of tramadol. Uh, like codeine, it is also ineffective in poor metabolizers and it is potentially toxic in ultra-rapid metabolizers, hence uh, restricted use in children. Uh, coming to the pharmacokinetics, when given poor orally, uh, it has a bioavailability of 65 to 75%, which increases up to 90% when multiple doses are uh, used. It acts within 30 minutes to an hour and reaches the peak plasma concentration within two hours. The plasma half-life is six hours, uh, and the half-life of the active metabolite is 7.4 hours. This becomes very important, especially in cases of cirrhosis or in those patients having severe renal failure where this half-life doubles. So uh, the active metabolite will uh, stay in the body for a much longer time. Uh, and the duration of action for the drug is about 4 to 9 hours. Coming to uh, certain uh, risks and cautions to be taken while the patient is on methadone, uh, it has an uh, increased risk of seizures if the total daily dose uh, is exceeding 400 uh, milligrams per day. If the drug is used concurrently with other medications which also lower the seizure threshold like tricyclic antidepressants, SSRIs, antipsychotics and also other opioids. Uh, also, there is a risk of seizure with rapid IV injection of tramadol. So, this should be kept in mind uh, whenever the patients are given tramadol, especially in an emergency setting. Caution has to be taken uh, if the patient has a prior history of epilepsy, head trauma, or raised intracranial pressure. 
uh, in those patients having severe hepatic or severe renal impairment and also while giving other anti exercise or tca there may be a risk of serotonin toxicity certain adverse effects uh, associated with the drug are dizziness nausea vomiting headache or uh, fatigue sweating dry mouth and constipation uh, it is contraindicated in severe hepatic impairment uh, those with end stage renal failure with uh, having a creatinine clearance of less than 10 ml per minute and in those patients who uh, do not have who have uncontrolled epilepsy uh, starting a patient on tramadol uh, so most of the patients that would present to us would already be on a non opioid drug so the starting dose would usually include uh, 50 mg to be given four orally with a dosing frequency of either 6 hours to 8 hours if needed the doses can be increased gradually with a maximal dose up to 400 mg per day uh, now if the patient is on a modified release tablet of tramadol uh, which would be either on a 12 hour regimen or a 24 hour regimen uh, immediate release for oral tramadol can be used for uh, breakthrough pain in those patients having severe renal impairment uh, we can half the starting dose of the tramadol so 50 mg can be given but uh, in a 12 uh, hourly dose and if needed uh, it can also be increased gradually with a maximum dose up to 200 mg per day uh, it is best avoided in those patients with uh, severe hepatic impairment uh, in even in moderate it is best to avoid but if it is unavoidable and there are no other drugs available uh, lower starting doses and a uh, less frequent dosing can be considered uh, tramadol is one tenth as potent of morphine uh, so just to keep in mind like if we are using uh, injectable tramadol say 100 mg uh, in an emergency setting that is almost equivalent to 10 mg of iv morphine uh, now we do have tramadol available as oral tablets capsules injectables it is also available as plain or fixed dose combinations with non opioids like paracetamol and diclofenac uh ending tramadol abrupt stopping may sometimes cause symptoms of withdrawal so tapering is recommended over several days however uh, it is not seen if it is being substituted by another opioid uh coming to tapentadol uh, tapentadol is also a centrally acting analgesic it has a dual mode of action as an agonist at the mu opioid receptor and as a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor it is also metabolized in the liver however via glucuronidation uh, reaction to inactive metabolites and less than 15% undergo metabolism via the cyp450 enzyme uh, the per oral bioavailability is only 32% uh, the onset of action is less than an hour per immediate release tablet it reaches its peak plasma concentration uh, in approximately 2 hours the plasma half life is for 4 hours and the duration of action is for 4 to 6 hours and the pharmacokinetics considerably change uh, when we are using a modified release tablet uh, there is uh, has also caution to be applied when using tapentadol if the patient has epilepsy head trauma raised intracranial pressure and in those patients with severe hepatic impairment or renal impairment with compromised respiratory function and paralytic yield uh, to start the patient on tapentadol the starting doses would be 50 mg given either say 4 hourly if the patient is moderate pain or if the patient is a uh, strong opioid need uh, high doses would be needed if the patient severe pain or there is previous history of a strong opioid use if need aggressive increase uh, to 100 mg can be done either 4 or 150 mg and the maximum recommended around 600 mg per uh now no dose adjustments are required uh, when using tramadol in patients with mild hepatic impairment uh, however in moderate hepatic failure an initial dose of 50 mg q8 uh, hourly or q12 hourly uh, can be uh, used uh, no dose adjustments are recommended in either mild to moderate renal impairment not recommended in severe hepatic or renal impairment due to lack of adequate data uh, just to for the quick review uh, tapentadol 50 mg when used per orally is almost equivalent to 15 mg of morphine used per orally now coming on to morphine uh, which is the main pharmacologically active constituent of opium it is a strong opioid of choice in moderate to severe cancer pain it is mediated by effects on specific opioid receptors in cns and as well as peripherally uh, peripherally the action is normally at the smooth muscles however in uh, patients having tissue injury or inflammation 
there is an increase in the number of opioid receptors at the peripheral end of the nociceptive aspirin nerve fibers which causes a release of exogenous and endogenous opioids and this is the uh, peripheral analgesic effect that is seen it also acts as a cough suppressant uh, it increases the intestinal transit time via effect on mind trick plexus which is the basis for opioid induced constipation so concurrent or uh, laxative prescription uh, is always to be given whenever we prescribe the patients with morphine uh, morphine is also metabolized in the liver uh, it is the metabolism is by a glucuronidation reaction to morphine 3 glucuronide and morphine 6 glucuronide uh, now m6g is the metabolite which is responsible for analgesia as well as the side effects excretion is seen uh, 90% in the urine Uh, coming to the pharmacokinetics of morphine, uh, when used per orally, uh, bioavailability is thirty-five percent. The peak effect is uh, about an hour when normal release tablets are given per orally. Uh, however, when uh, used IV, the peak effect would be achieved within twenty minutes. And uh, in subcutaneous uh, doses, the peak uh, effect is observed within ninety minutes. Uh, Into peak plasma concentration. Uh, depends upon the route of administration of the drug it is about 15 to 60 minutes when given per orally and uh, sustained release dose is used and about 15 minutes if the route used is subcutaneous uh, the half life of morphine uh, is 1.5 to 4.5 hours and when given iv it is 1.5 hours however in those patients with renal failure uh, the plasma half life increases considerably to 7.5 hours because of accumulation of the m6g uh, in these patients uh, it acts for about 3 to 6 hours and uh, when given uh, as an immediate release drug and if used as, uh, as a sustained release drug it acts for about 12 to 24 hours uh, to start the patient on morphine uh, if the patient is already on a weak opioid an equivalent dose has to be calculated uh, the usual starting doses to keep in mind would be 10 mg given either q4 to 6 or 6 hourly uh, whenever changing uh, the patient uh, to morphine from another strong opioid higher doses may be needed uh, if the patient is an elderly patient or a frail patient or is opioid naive lower initial doses uh, would be used uh, which would be 5 mg given uh, via 4 or 6 hourly dose in those patients having mild to moderate renal impairment again lower starting doses and less frequent dosing uh, would be important whenever adjusting dose of morphine always take the prn doses into account and whenever changing uh, the total dose of morphine based on the prn doses the increment should not exceed 30 to 50% every 24 hours uh now in those patients uh, who have an ileostomy or who have frequent vomiting or diarrhea modified release morphine is best to be avoided because these patients will likely have a poor absorption of the drug and that will cause an unsatisfactory analgesia a uh, routine prescription of antiemetic and laxative uh, is required in all patients whenever starting them on morphine uh so to start the drug and titrate the dose uh, if you are using a per oral tablet uh, which is of immediate release the dosing most commonly used would be a 4 hourly dosing and the prn dosing used would be 1/10 or 1/6 of the total 24 hour dose so in these patients uh, the they have to be reviewed within one or two days recalculate the total of q4 hourly dose by dividing the total dose used in the previous uh, day along with the prn doses so for example if the patient is using a morphine dose of 10 mg q4 hourly uh, on day 1 and after that the patient is requiring about 3 prn daily doses so the total dose uh, required calculated would be the total dose on day 1 along with the prn doses and that total dose will now have to be divided into a 4, 4 hourly regimen now continue this 4 hourly regimen along with uh, prn doses as needed with increase in the regular dose until adequate analgesia is uh, achieved and also at the same time we have to make sure that there is no undesirable side effects seen in the patients when we are increasing this dose uh, whenever using a q4 hourly regimen it is important that we make sure that we uh, advise the patients to take a double dose at bed time so that it obviates the need to wake the patient in the middle of the night for uh, for his dose when using uh, immediate release and modified release together uh, once we uh, use this algorithm and achieve a stable dose uh, that 
is of the 4 hourly regimen we can replace that dose with a 12 hourly regimen uh, by taking a, using the modified release so if the total dose required is 120 mg per day for a patient it can be divided into a 60 mg q12 hourly dosing and along with that uh, make sure to give an immediate release morphine uh, for the prn uh, doses uh if the patients have to be generally modified release tablets should be uh, avoided as a starting dose or to achieve analgesia in a patient but if unavoidable if that is what is available generally start with a modified release uh, morphine dose of 20 to 30 mg with a q12 hourly regimen or if the patient is an elderly or a frail patient then half the dose and keep the frequency uh, of the dosing uh, the same and in all, in these patients also always give immediate release uh, morphine tablets for pr and doses whenever needed increase the dose of the product every 2 to 3 days until adequate analgesia is achieved uh, and to always keep in mind so that within every 24 hours if we are increasing the total opioid dose of the patient the total increment should not exceed 33 to 50% uh, coming on to Every morphine is used for rapid relief of severe pain and acute trauma or medical emergencies. In opioid nice patients, it can be given prophylactically along with metoclopramide. A total of five to ten mg IV morphine can be given over five to ten minutes and two point five to five mg in elderly patients. If insufficient additional morphine at one to two milligrams can be given until satisfactory relief is used. Other uh, routes of administration could include buccal morphine and rectal morphine. Although it is not really recommended, uh, it can still be considered for off-label use in moribund patients when other options are not available. Uh, for the rapid titration of IV morphine in opioid patients, uh, there are two regimens uh, that can be considered. So this one is uh, by the Institute of Palliative Medicine uh, India. So the prerequisites for this would be if the patient is already having a moderate to severe pain of more than five by ten on the NRS. and there is a probability that they will respond to partial or complete response to opioids because they have already been on a non opioid so once iv access is achieved uh, and antiemetic is given routinely unless it is contraindicated uh, dilute the iv morphine in a 10 ml syringe and the starting dose uh, they used was 1.5 mg every 10 minutes until the patient was pain free or had complaints of undue sedation Uh, with this method, they found about 80% patients who had complete pain relief with less than 10 mg uh, or less of IV morphine dose. So, uh, if the ongoing treatment uh, to continue the treatment after the IV morphine, we converted into a four oral uh, regimen of Q4 hourly. So, we rounded off to the nearest uh, dose. So, if about three to six milligrams of IV morphine was required for a patient to control their acute pain. Uh, considering 5 mg of four oral morphine the so the minimum dose needed for this patient would be 5 mg which will now be given in a q4 or q6 hourly regimen uh, which will be individualized according to the patient another method for the titration i uh, recommended by the cleveland clinic in ohio so if whenever used iv we start with 1 mg given uh, per minute up to 10 mg wait for 5 minutes which is peak the same dose if it is required again wait for 5 minutes and repeat as needed and for the subcutaneous dose uh, it would be double the dose so 2 mg can be given every 5 minutes up to 10 mg so they uh, did a uh, titration up to a maximum of 30 mg and if the patient still had uncontrolled pain at 30 mg the cause of the pain has to be always re reviewed uh, to maintain a uh, so this regimen did not convert uh, the iv morphine immediately to the oral morphine after the initial uh, pain control with iv morphine continuous iv morphine was given to these patient over a period of 3 to 5 days and only then converted to a four oral regimen so for acu- cumulative effective doses in these patients uh, so supposing a patient has required 9 mg of iv morphine so if it has to be given intermittently you round it up to the nearest dose the so 10 mg of iv morphine would now be given to the patient every 4 hourly but if giving via continuous iv infusion the total dose can be calculated and titrated uh, according to the need of the patient uh, coming on to fentanyl which is another strong opioid uh, which is a strong new opioid agonist uh, 
uh, it is lipophilic in nature, mostly sequestered in body fat, uh, in, in epidural fat and white matter by the central nervous system. So if we are using fentanyl by any route, after systemic redistribution, it will act supraspinally in the thalamus and cause a massive decrease in opioid molecules outside the CNS. This is the possible mechanism by which it contributes to less constipation and less peripherally mediated withdrawal symptoms. Uh, now the elimination of uh, fentanyl is by biotransformation in the liver by CYP3A4 enzyme to an inactive metabolite, which is more fentanyl, and the excretion uh, is in urine. So the stated delivery rates for fentanyl, uh, especially when using a transdermal drug, would mean that amount of the drug delivered to the patient throughout the patch's recommended duration of dose. Inter-individual variability is always present in the amount delivered. So it will always depend upon the dose of the drug that is used in the patch. So if the patient is uh, using a patch of say 100 micrograms uh, per hour of fentanyl, the mean uh, rate of delivery of the drug uh, could be 97 plus minus 15 milligrams per hour. And there will always be some amount of unused fentanyl which is left in the patch of three days, which could vary from 30 to 85 percent of the original content. And in those patients who are cachectic, the plasma concentrations are reduced by one third or half, and it possibly is due to a loss of skin hydration. Uh, for transdermal fentanyl, the onset uh, begins. Uh, is inter individually uh, vari variable and it could be 3 to 23 hours. Uh, the plasma half life is 13 to 22 hours and the duration of action is 72 hours. However, for some patients, it is 48 hours and it might uh, require a more frequent change in the patches in these patients. When used IV, it will act within 1.5 minutes and uh, the duration of action lasts for about 60 minutes. Now, there are certain factors which will contribute to adverse events when using fentanyl, uh, especially among uh, the physicians, that there is some lack of appreciation that fentanyl is a strong opiate analgesic. It is inappropriate when it is used short-term intermittent or for post-operative pain, especially in patients who have not been receiving any strong opiate before. Lack of patient education regarding directions for safe use, stories, and disposal lack of awareness of signs of an overdose and when the patient should seek attention, lack of awareness of the rate of absorption of fentanyl, which may be increased if the skin under the patch becomes vasodilated, lack of awareness of drug interaction, dispensing and application of higher strength patches than prescribed and incorrect disposal. It can also be associated with accidental exposure and death in children if they are exposed to these patches. Uh, so the transdermal formulation which is available uh, comes in two formulations is a matrix patch and a reservoir patch. So as we can see, the matrix patch is a much thinner patch. Uh, it is uh, The drug is in a drug adhesive layer controlled by the physical characteristics of the matrix. Bioequivalence has been demonstrated across both the patches. However, uh, it is important that we still prescribe fentanyl by the brand recommended because the strength of the patch, uh, even if it's an equal strength of the patch, it will differ uh, uh, in their size. And there might be some confusion with the patients while dispensing the drug. Adverse events most commonly seen in those with fentanyl include drowsiness, dizziness, headache, insomnia, nausea, vomiting. And in some patients, there could be muscle rigidity when the uh, drug is given IV, which can be avoided by giving a slow uh, infusion of the drug. Drug interactions are most commonly seen with uh, CYP3 4 uh, inhibitors and inducers. Uh, fentanyl also uh, reduces the metabolism of metazolam by reducing the clearance by 30% and by extending the half life. Uh, now, when do we start a patient of transdermal fentanyl? If there is intolerable, undesirable effects with morphine, like nausea, vomiting, constipation, or hallucination, if the patient is having renal failure, there is tablet phobia or poor compliance with oral medication or a high risk of tablet misuse or diversion. It is contraindicated in those patients with short-term pain and especially in those who require a rapid dose titration for severe uncontrolled pain. Uh, so approximately, uh, to keep in mind the usual poor oral doses of morphine use, if a patient is on a poor oral dose of 30, uh, 60 or 90 milligrams of morphine, the uh, Dose for the fentanyl use would be 12, 25, or 37.5 uh, milligrams. Uh, this could be keep in mind for easy dose conversions across the two. Uh, whenever we give uh, 
or if in those uh, if it is not exactly equivalent to the strength of the patch we round up to slightly higher doses if the patient is in pain and slightly lower doses if the patient is pain free and free and whenever switching because of possible opioid induced hyperalgesia reduce the calculated equivalent dose by 25 to 50 pot uh when we convert the patient from morphine to fentanyl uh, in the initial 12 hours after applying the patch regular doses of morphine should be continued for the first 12 hours and if the patient uh, is on a modified release then you apply the patch and give the final dose of the modified release morphine at the same time and if the patient is was on a morphine infusion then you continue the infusion unchanged for about 8 to 12 hours after applying the patch and only then stop uh, the infusion so these are some starting doses when the fentanyl is uh, used by other routes uh, by iv we can start with 50 to 200 mg and with 50 mg uh, given prn doses and the dose will appropriately be reduced to elderly and debilitated patients coming to buprenorphine which is a partial mu uh, receptor and oral one agonist Uh, and an antagonist like kappa and delta receptors that causes less hyperalgesia less tolerance and less effect on endocrine and immune system less constipation and less effect on the biliary pancreatic duct when compared to morphine and analgesia is due to mu opioid receptors and at usual analgesic doses it does act as a full mu opioid agonist in some patients common polymorphism are seen which does reduce the efficacy uh, of the drug used in these patients uh coming to the bioavailability oral bioavailability is only 15% for these patients uh, the bioavailability of sublingual drug is about 50% vomiting is more common with the sublingual administration than im or transdermal administration it is generally safe to use in patients with renal impairment as it does not accumulate and it is not removed by hemodialysis so the analgesia remains unaffected uh, whenever uh, Uh, it uh, takes about 18 to 24 hours to act, and the duration lasts for about seven days. Uh, coming to its potency, it has a longer duration of action than morphine, and sublingual buprenorphine is about 80 times more potent than oral morphine, half as potent as IV or IM uh, buprenorphine. Uh, and transdermal buprenorphine is 70 to 115 times more potent than oral morphine. the drug interactions are similar to fentanyl which is why the cyp 3a4 patch it is also available as a transdermal patch comes in various formulation uh, as 7d or either 3 to 4 day patches it is also through a drug in adhesive matrix distribution uh, absorption in skin is through the skin and into systemic circulation by stratum corneum and blood flow and increased absorption is seen if there is vasodilation or there is a warm skin there is an increased risk of erythema and contact dermatitis seen when buprenorphine is used uh, again it is indicated uh, similar indications to uh, fentanyl and it can also be uh, used in patients who have a high risk of tablet misuse or diversion and it is also contraindicated in acute short term pain when the patient is opioid naive the usual starting doses would be 5 or uh, 10 mg uh, per hour of patches Uh, when using a sublingual dose the recommended starting dose uh, would be 200 micrograms given 8 hourly uh, along with an appropriate rescue analgesic though sublingual buprenorphine is not an ideal rescue medication when used it should be one tenth of the total uh, daily dose uh, dose titration should be done every 4 to 5 uh, hours uh, the sublingual drug should not be chewed or swallowed as it will reduce the efficacy of the drug uh, uh, just briefly going over oxycodone and hydromorphone which has the character similar to morphine uh, metabolized by the cyp 3a4 or uh, 75% bioavailable with action within 30 minutes and action lasting for 4 to 6 hours available as ir sr preparations or parenteral preparations and most uh, similar characteristics uh, seen with hydromorphone Uh, which has a faster uh, onset of action in less than five minutes, and it acts for about four to five hours. Uh, though we do not have either of these drugs available in India, uh, we just briefly overlook through methadone, which will be covered in much more detail in a dedicated class uh, for methadone. It is a mu opioid receptor agonist with possibly a delta opioid receptor uh, agonistic action. an mda receptor channel blocker and a presynaptic blocker of uh, serotonin reuptake 
uh, again, the indications would be intolerance to other opioids, pain which is poorly responsive to morphine, renal impairment, neuropathic pain, uh, difficulties with uh, using uh, methadone as a wide variable, uh, plasma half-life, uh, com complicated dosing, uh, metabolism which is modified by other drugs used in a palliative care setting and associated with prolonged uh, uh, 80% bioavailable when given orally uh, and it uh, on the within 30 minutes, uh, though the half-life is 20 to 35 hours with uh, inter-individual variability and the range of the half-life uh, is as long as 5 to 130 hours. It is more uh, useful in patients with specific neurotoxicity seen with morphine. So if the so patient has hyperalgesia, allodynia, or myoclonus or sedation, they will generally benefit by switching to methadone. Alternative strong opiate for patients with severe renal impairment and it can be used in a mixed nociceptive neuropathic pain due to an additional NMDA receptor action. Uh, so the morphine equivalent daily dose and the conversion ratio of the methadone will change accordingly. So if it, the patient is on less than 30 milligrams of morphine, the conversion ratio would be 2 is to 1 and it will uh, progressively keep increasing as the dose of the morphine increases. There are uh, three methods uh, when switching to methadone. This is a three-day switch where the morphine is tailed off and methadone is progressively introduced over three days. Stop and go regular dose where morphine is abruptly stopped and switched to a regular dose of morphine. And stop and go PRN dose where morphine is abruptly stopped and for the first week, PRN doses of methadone is used to establish a regular dose. TCF recommends the stop and go PRN dose method when shifting a patient uh, to methadone. Certain common can be seen while we shift uh, the patients or while opioid rotations are done is failure to use other non-pharmac measures of pain control with holding of opioids uh, is for fear of addiction or until the pain is very advanced, failure to treat opioid or uh, induced side effects, uh, use of inappropriate opioid doses. So either too small or too large a dose with uh, inappropriate time intervals. Failure to allay fears and misconceptions regarding opioids, failure to prescribe them for breakthrough pain, and failure to determine the cause of pain, and use by an inappropriate route. Uh, and use of textbook opioid conversions without consideration of individual patient characteristics. So briefly, uh, looking through breakthrough pain, which is a transient exacerbation of pain occurring either spontaneously or due to a specific trigger. Uh, this is despite a relatively stable and adequately controlled background pain. Uh, if there is poorly relieved background pain, there will be a requirement of regular increase in the increase in the regular analgesic. That is not a true breakthrough pain. And end of dose interval pain is also not a true breakthrough pain. It is common in cancer patients. Well, in less than 80% of patients on opiates for persistent pain, there was a survey done uh, which showed that a median number of episodes per day for breakthrough pain was about three, and it was generally of moderate to severe intensity with interference to activities of daily living. Uh, it could be either a predictable or incident uh, type of pain or an unpredictable or spontaneous pain. Or it could be functional or pathological and not susceptible to neuropathic. And the patient may experience more than one BPP, which may have different causes. So the treatment of each would differ accordingly. So before you start a patient on any uh, PRN doses, always make sure that we approach use a multimodality approach to treat breakthrough pain where correctable causes are corrected, non-drug measures are used, and at the same time, uh, we use uh, other drugs by relieving background pain using other opioids, non-opioids, and adjuvants, and prescribing rescue analgesics, which are fast-acting, short-lasting opioids, titrated uh, to the patient against efficacy and tolerability. So for PR and this is always been to use one-sixth of the total daily opioid dose, However, this approach will effectively double the opioid intake for the next four hours as your breakthrough pains are very short -lived. So an alternative practice suggested by some centers includes use of 10% of the daily opioid dose. Uh, standard fixed dose is unlikely to suit all patients and all pains because the intensity and impact of this will vary. So for optimal rescue dose, a range of 5 to 20% to be considered. And uh, the dose of opioid rescue medication should be determined by individual titration. Whenever uh, using strong opiates, uh, certain instructions should be given to the patients as well as the care givers. So when the patients are receiving opioid tablets, clear instructions should be written regarding the strength of the drug, frequency of the dosing with instructions for PR and dosing. When taking PR and dosing, they have to be uh, instructed to not omit the next regular dose of opioid. 
they should not be sharing these drugs with anybody else they should be st uh, strictly kept away from children store them in a safely in a closed container without moisture if for any reason they are unused they have to be returned back to the hospital or the clinic and whenever the patients are using a modified release product they should be advised that their products have to be followed whole crushing or chewing will lead to a rapid release of the drug and it may cause an overdose in a patient and when giving transdermal patches uh, they should be instructed to write the date of application along with the date of renewal on on the patch should be applied to a dry non inflamed non irradiated hairless skin on the upper trunk or arm if body hair is present to be clipped with scissors and not shaved press the patch for 30 seconds it should stick, stick to the skin completely without wrinkling micropore or tegaderm application to ensure adherence and hot fermentation should not be applied directly over the patch Uh, even though showers can be done, hot water uh, bath or soak should be avoided. Patches should be removed before MRI scan. New patches to be applied in different position to rest the underlying skin for three to six days. Old patches should be removed before applying the new one. Disposal uh, should be done properly with by folding the patch inwards with the adhesive side inwards. And uh, unused patches to be returned and to notify the treating doctor if fever or any other side effect immediately. So, on the four of the drugs, uh, relative potency uh, of the analgesic uh, with respect to morphine. So, codeine and tramadol is relatively potent, one tenth as potent as morphine. Tepentadol is one third as potent. Methadone is five to ten times as potent. Buprenorphine uh, and fentanyl is about hundred uh, times uh, potency, which is relative to morphine. And the duration of action for each of these drugs change accordingly. Uh, so when uh, using uh, con the conversion ratios according to the potency of the drug, uh, uh, the most commonly used uh, this that we would see would be a change from tramadol to morphine, which is a 10 is to 1 ratio. So if the patient is on a regular dose of 200 milligrams of tramadol, divide the total daily dose uh, by uh, 10, which will give you the total equivalent equivalent dose of morphine. So if the patient has been on a Dose of tramadol of 200 milligrams, then you convert it to a morphine dose of 20 milligrams per day. Uh, in a similar way, if you have to convert the patient from a four oral morphine or uh, dose to a transdermal buprenorphine or a fentanyl dose, uh, we could use uh, for ease of uh, conversion, we could use the ratio as 100 is to one. So that would be uh, divided. The total dose of oral morphine would be divided by that ratio. And uh, we'll get the appropriate uh, dose for the transdermal drug. So, for if the patient was on a morphine of 300 milligrams per day, uh, the equivalent analgesic dose of fentanyl would be a 3,000 microgram per day, which will will be divided into a per hourly dosing. So, in this patient, supposing 125 micrograms uh, per hour has to be used. So, then two patches of uh, 100 microgram strength and 25 microgram strength will have to be used in this patient. Similarly, while converting per oral morphine to an IV morphine or IV fentanyl, the ratio will differ. So, when converting oral morphine to IV morphine, the ratio used would be two is to one. So, if we are using 60 milligrams of per oral morphine, the same patient will require 30 milligrams of IV morphine. And while converting morphine to fentanyl, the same ratio would be used, which was used for oral morphine to transdermal fentanyl. Uh, When converting IV to an IV dose or converting subcutaneous to a subcutaneous dose, uh, for morphine to fentanyl, the ratio will now change to 50 to 75 to uh, one. So, if the total dose required for uh, morphine is 30 milligram for a patient in 24 hours, the total fentanyl dose required in this patient would now be 400 milligram for 24 hours, which ha will have to be divided into four hourly doses. So if a continuous infusion has to be used, 400 milligrams can be used. If we want to give a PRN dose or an intermittent dosing regimen for this patient, it will have to be divided again by 24 hours to get the appropriate dosing. Now, because of wide uh, range in the four oral bioavailability, whenever we switch from four oral to substitute IV or IM morphine, the dose required is between half to one third of the four oral dose. Now, most centers use a conversion ratio. When converting four oral to IV of two is to one. Conversely, when switching from IV to four oral, the four oral dose should be two to three times greater than the IV dose. The problem here is the one size fits all and other urban legends. 
it is a problem with all of these states in their individual variability in relative potency estimates there is an assumption that relative potency ratios remains irrespective of the level of the opioid there is no account for possibility of active metabolite accumulation uh, via these conversions there is no account for unidirectional cross tolerance and tolerance development with repetitive dosing so a dose reduction of 25 to 75 percent for incomplete cross tolerance is often inadequately portrayed and much of the data which is obtained for these conversion ratios has been from single dose crossover studies on acute pain so morphine is not always the answer uh, it might be like mother's milk to all the practitioners because we are familiar with it there are formulations available it is very easily accessible very easily available low cost and it has proven effectiveness how However, 80 percent of cancer patients still show poor responsiveness to a given opioid like morphine during routine administration. So, it is imperative that we, as palliative care practitioners, should be able to transition from one opioid to the another with ease, which may require change in route of the administration and/or dosage formulation. So, which brings us to the topic of opioid rotation and switching. Opioid rotation switching is a change in the opioid drug or route of administration with the goal of improving the outcome. the effectiveness encompasses improved analgesic efficacy reduced adverse effects and or improved treatment related outcomes associated with physical or psychosocial functioning or quality of life when do we now uh, rotate the patients uh, to other opioids based on these potency uh, ratios that we saw uh, when there is occurrence of intolerable adverse effects during dose titration when there is poor analgesic efficacy despite aggressive dose titration problematic drug drug interaction preference or need for a different route of administration change in clinical status of the patient or clinical setting that suggests benefit from an opioid with different pharmacokinetic properties and financial or availability consideration specific switches are needed if there is poor adherence in the patient we would prefer a transdermal or route of administration if there is significant decline in renal function we can go for buprenorphine fentanyl or methadone in these patients it induce hyperalgesia or other neurotoxicities like cognitive failure delirium hallucination myoclonus or allodynia other drugs like fentanyl oxycodone or methadone can be preferred if there is inadequate pain relief with intolerable undesirable side effects a transdermal buprenorphine or buprenorphine or transdermal fentanyl can be used instead of oral morphine so whenever we have to shift a patient to another opioid uh, there is a two step uh, method Uh, so calculate the equivalent dose of the new opioid based on these equivalent tables whenever switching to any opioid other than methadone or fentanyl identify an automatic dose reduction window of 25 to 50 percent lower than the calculated analgesic dose uh, because there are complete cross tolerance and individual variation between the patients but if switching to methadone identify this window at 75 to 90 percent lower than the calculated equivalent analgesic dose For individuals who are on very high opioid doses, like thousand milligrams of morphine equivalents per day, great caution should be exercised in converting to methadone at doses of hundred milligrams or greater per day. If switching to transdermal fentanyl, calculate dose conversions based on the equivalent dose. Always lower bound dose, or twenty five percent reduction or fifty percent reduction on the basis of clinical judgment that the The dose, these op, uh, equivalent analgesic dose tables are relatively more or less applicable, respectively, to the specific characteristics of the opioid regimen or patient. Uh, select an upper bound uh, dose uh, if the patient is receiving a relatively high dose of the current opioid regimen, is elderly, or if the patient is medically frail. A lower bound dose if the if they are switching to another uh, route of administration of systemic drug administration using the same drug. or uh, the second step would be to perform an assessment of pain severity and other medical or psychosocial characteristics to determine whether to apply an additional increase or decrease of 15 to 30 percent to enhance the likelihood that the initial dose will be effective for pain or conversely unlikely to cause withdrawal or opioid related side effects always have a strategy to frequently assess initial response and titrate the dose of the new opioid regimen to optimize outcome If a supplemental rescue dose is used for titration, calculate this at five to fifteen percent of the total daily opioid dose, and administer at an appropriate interval. 
If an oral transmucosal fentanyl formulation is used as a rescue dose, begin dosing at one of the lower doses, irrespective of the baseline opioid dose. Routine reduction in the calculated equivalent uh, dose of the new opioid should be done by 25 to 50 percent, and it should always be dependent on patient factors. So you don't reduce uh, the calculated dose if it is a young patient, if there are no undesirable side effects of the previously used opioid, if the patient is in severe pain, or when you're switching at a very low dose. But reduction of at least 50 percent is required if it is an older patient, if the patient is delirious, or if the patient is in moderate pain, and especially whenever we switch these patients at high doses of the drug. So points to note that conversion ratios are only an approximate guide. Careful monitoring will avoid underdosing and overdosing. Opioid pharmacokinetics do have a very wide inter-individual variability and various factors like age, ethnicity, renal impairment, hepatic impairment, other variables like dose, duration of opioid treatment, direction of switch in the opioid, nutritional status, concurrent medication uh, will affect the conversion ratios accordingly. Before switching, always, always consider if other options may be more appropriate, such as use of adjuvant analysis or modifying the management of undesirable effects. Now, what is the evidence for opioid rotation? This was one of the first papers on opioid rotation. Until this time, only opioid dose escalations and drugs for side effects were used. So uh, here they had found that uh, we can be relieved by opioid rotations and a choice of two or three different opioids is always necessary to obtain satisfactory long-term pain control. These are a couple of studies uh, which showed uh, the effectiveness of opioid switching to manage pain relief. However, in most of the studies, uh, significant findings were not noted. So the Cochrane Review uh, did not uh, show effectiveness because of lack of RCTs. In the European Palliative Care Research Collaborative, uh, even though six, uh, it did conclude that the pain intensity was significantly reduced in majority of the studies uh, that were seen, and serious adverse effects did improve. Uh, the authors were, however, very critical of the study design limitation. So in all of these, uh, what happened? Uh, lack of high quality data, which is sub, uh, which uh, supports the switch to other opioids. So, K-Metal did a randomized study in 2015. Uh, however, it uh, where opioid rotation versus combination were used for cancer patients with chronic uncontrollable pain. However, it did not find any significant differences between both the strategies with respect to pain relief. Another open label randomized crossover trial was used, uh, which had a very good sample size. The results of the secondary analysis did support switching in these patients, but this study also remains underpowered. Uh, the WHO guidelines also make no recommendation for or against the practice of opioid switching or rotation, uh, which brings us that this is a very good research opportunity for all the palliative care physicians uh, where there is not enough literature to support opioid rotation or switching and not enough data from an Indian setting. Uh, so uh, an international survey of opioid rotation and conversion ratios used by palliative patients was uh, con uh, conducted by the MD Anderson team. Uh, it conducted a survey which uh, showed uh, across three seven across 53 countries there were 370 responses, multiply statistically and clinically significant in reported opioid rotation and conversion ratios according to the region. And there was wide uh, variation in opioid rotation ratios and conversion ratios among palliative care physicians, uh, clinicians themselves, which brings us to the topic that there is an absence of standard practice and there is need for guidelines to be developed for standard practice to be done across all palliative care physicians when using these drugs. Thank you very much. Uh, now, thank you, Dr. Shreya, for uh, taking us all on a seamless walk uh, through basics of opioids and also touching upon the evidence base uh, on this Monday morning. So, I uh, invite Dr. Joita, ma'am, for her inputs, ma'am. 
Yeah, I'll just uh, keep it brief. Thank you, Shreya, for an extremely uh, comprehensive uh, presentation using a very strong resource and bringing out salient points in, uh, in each of the drugs and made it very interesting. Uh, I think uh, we should take questions uh, at the, before. Uh, there are a few points which I would like to uh, emphasize on, but maybe we should give uh, opportunity for asking questions and then we can take if there is any time. Thank you. Yes, uh, so Dr. Neetu has asked uh, whether there is a, a comparison between tramadol and tapenadol. Shreya, do you want to take that? Uh, there is no uh, recommended dose conversion given in the uh, PCF. So whenever converting, we use the equianalgesic doses with respect to morphine if we have to uh, convert it to uh, tapentadol. Uh, yes, Rhea. Yeah, uh, you're right. And we have one more question in the chat. Uh, when half of half life of morphine is four hours, four and a half hours, how is it that uh, you are skipping two AM dose and giving double dose at <coughs> 10, 10. So uh, uh, ideally it is four and a half hours to six hours. Uh, so that is how the uh, four hour or the six hour dosing is done. It will change according to each of individual. So uh, like I said, it is given as a standard factor that it would help if we skip the 10 a.m. dose. In majority of the patients, at least in the hospital, we have seen that it helps the patient because they do not have to wake up in the middle of the night. But uh, like the question mentioned, some people do come back saying that they do not have uh, eat, like good analgesia, especially at night, because they are not waking up for that dose. So if they are skipping that dose at night, then they do have less pain. So I think it is on an individual basis that we have to see according to the patient need. Uh, thank you, Shreya. Uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Uh, so this platform is open for uh, comments and inputs from all the expert faculty and our dear teachers. So I think Neetu again is asking that she's not asking about the dose conversion. She's asking which is better, Tependadol or Tramadol. Jutna or Shreya, anybody wants to take this question? Uh, so, Dr. Neetu, there is no uh, high quality evidence to say that tapenadol is superior or tramadol is superior. So, we just have uh, observational strategies and we just have individual data as of now. And one Dr. Lata is asking what diet is advised for patient on morphine? Shreya, do you want to take the question? Shreya, the mic is, I think. Jasna, would you like to answer this? Uh, so basically, the uh, yeah, I mean, it is not a scientific thing that about diet and morphine because uh, it is basically uh, about the pharmacology and things like that. So high fiber diet, if it's a low fiber diet, it will be an additional uh, cause for constipation. So we don't want to add on to that. So basically, uh, we will advise that uh, patient should take high fiber diet plus he should take a lot of water. So they should keep themselves hydration because the morphine induced constipation is because opioid decreases peristalsis and it causes dehydration. So we should advise to take them a lot of water because most of the time when patients come back to the hospital and they uh, they are when we ask, either they are unable to take water or they have not keep, kept them hydra hydrated. So hydration as well as fiber rich diet is important for morphine induced constipation. So regarding trependadol and tremadol, I think it's right Jotsna, that there are no evidence that which is better. So um, we, are, we are not sure that which drug is better, but trependadol definitely is very expensive. Tremadol is a little bit affordable in the affordable range. So, we also have to see about individual uh, patients' needs because uh, it, the because the receptor profile is different 
and we have to see the liver and the kidney function. So I think it's important, but as Madam said, Tapintadol is so expensive it, and it is not available everywhere. And it is slightly more potent because it's 3.3 times the, I mean, morphine is 3.3 times thing and that is 1 by 10, which is the uh, dose conversion to tramadol. But there are no head-to-head -head trials on tapintadol and tramadol, which had been planned before but did not go through. So there are, uh, Pranit is asking, are there any op uh, Indian data? How do you, I uh, can't tell again question, uh, Pranit. Uh, yeah, so are there any Indian data. research data regarding opioid switching and rotation? Uh, no ma'am, there is no Indian data. We could not find any Indian, Indian data on opioid switching and rotation. Yes. So it's a research opportunity, maybe one of us can take it forward. And Dr. Rukmani is asking, how do you manage pain in patients with hepatic cirrhosis and meds in liver? So hepatocytic opioids, I think she has already covered it in her seminar, her seminar in a very detailed manner. Shreya, do you want to add anything? Uh, so I think depending upon the availability, uh, if morphine is that easily available, uh, then we will start with a very low dose with a very... Uh, with an increased frequency, so maybe five milligrams eight hourly or twelve hourly to see how the patients respond, uh, because it'll be it might be difficult to start these patients directly on fentanyl or maybe it may not be available or affordable to the patient. So then, according to the drug, whatever is available, if tramadol or morphine is available, or uh, reduced dosing with uh, less frequent dosing would be preferred. So I hope, Dr. Rukmani, you got the answer that if even if patient is having hepatotoxicity, hepatic or renal functions are deranged, we will not deprive these patients with morphine. These patients also needs medication, but we will keep very low dose and we have to monitor them carefully and the spacing and like frequency we have to reduce. Okay, so are there no, if there are no questions, then uh, Joyta, you want to say something? Otherwise, we can close. It's already 7.32. Uh, no, nothing, uh, nothing too uh, complicated. It's just that uh, uh, I, I think there are certain points we need to uh, mention is that tapentadol, there has been, we always talk about tramadol abuse, morphine abuse, etc. But tapentadol, there has been risk of abuse, which has been uh, uh, reported. Uh, that the post-op cautions for fentanyl, I think Shia has uh, written it uh, very well. And also very important is that buprenorphine, the ceiling effect is only for euphoria and this and in animal studies and then the analgesia, it's not for uh, in, in human studies. We have extensively looked at the research for that and that patient's uh, instructions, the transdermal sentinel patches, if possible, should actually be returned as to what books say. And that book by McPherson on that guide to conversion is very interesting. And everybody uh, wants to read that. Uh, thank you so much. So thank you, Jata. Thank you, Jatsna and Shreya. We will see you next week uh, before 6.30. And uh, what I will request all the audience that please uh, write questions as maximum as possible and keep this lecture, these lectures interactive. 